Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zev from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I've come down to see Andrea Grad. Andrea, how are you doing? Hi Zed, nice to meet you. You too as well. Really good. So if you're not familiar with Andrea, Andrea is a very talented spoon carver hailing from Romania. We're currently filming in London. This is a studio and apartment that actually belongs to Deborah Schnabel Morel, who if you've been familiar with my channel, you would have seen on previous videos. And currently Andrea is staying here and Deborah has very kindly allowed us to use this space to film this video. Now in this particular video, what Andrea is going to kindly do is demonstrate her process for carving a traditional Romanian spoon. Now if you're not familiar with what style of spoon that is, don't worry, we'll all be looking at some examples in the next scene. So a couple of things to get out of the way before we get into the meat and bones of the video. Number one, this video has been divided up into chapters. So if you look at the timestamp on the bottom of this video, and if you hover over that, you can see the different sections of this video marked out. Also, if you look in the description below this video, you will see all the different sections of this video listed out. Now YouTube has a very cool feature where on the left hand side of that, you'll see all the time numbers. If you click on that, YouTube has a cool feature where it will jump to that specific section of this video. As you can see from the length of this video, it is quite a meaty video. That's because there's a lot to show throughout this entire process because what Andrea is going to do is take literally a raw piece of wood and end up with a completely finished product and we're going to be able to see all the insights along the way. So like I said, time stands for all the sections of the video marked out. Secondly, I will be putting a link below to Andrea's website and her Instagram where you can find a lot more information about the work that she does. So Andrea, with your kind permission, shall we get started? Yes. Let's, let's do, do that. Let's do it. <laughs> so guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Andrea Grad is going to be showing you how to carve a traditional Romanian spoon. So Andrea, um, before we get into looking at the selection of spoons that we have displayed over here, for those that may not be familiar with you, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself in terms of where you're from and your journey into spoon carving? Yes, yes. So I am from Romania, from Transylvania, and I started spoon carving about a little under two years ago um, during the pandemic. I just wanted to do something more tangible and we had a big ice storm in the town where I was living in and they lost a lot of trees, a lot of deer trees with memories that they had with their children. So I just had this inkling to um, just ask for, for people if they want me to make spoons for them. Um, and just a week before that happened, I found a YouTube video on uh, tiny homes and someone was giving a tour of their tiny home and that's actually how I got into spoon carving. I just saw a rack of spoons on the wall in a tiny home and I was just curious, well how do you make that? And the first video that I found on YouTube searching for that was Zed's video with Deborah. It was actually filmed right here so for me it's just such a full circle. Um, so yeah, I, I, when that happened with the town and the ice storm, I just started spoon carving about 300 spoons, 300 people that brought their wood to the front step and it was just such an amazing experience. Terrifying to, <laughs> to have to commit to such a huge undertaking, but um, it taught me quite a bit and I got to, the opportunity to learn to carve and also try so many different kinds of wood. And that's how it all started. And so what brings you to the UK? I came to the UK to come to Spoonfest for the first time this year. And I taught there and, and then I went to Spoon Town and just got a chance to meet everyone in person. Uh, just during the pandemic, we were all on Rise Up and Carve and met a lot of people online and then I just heard about all these wonderful carvers and just got a chance to meet them in person. So that's why I've been touring um, people's places and getting a chance to meet them. That's wonderful. Yeah. So now moving on to the spoons we have on the table. Yeah. Um, 
In terms of where we'd like to start, is there any way in particular you'd like to start? Yeah, we can start over here. Um, so when I started making spoons, I actually did a lot of um, cooking spoons. Um, these particular ones are for a project that uh, David White and I did um, at some point. We decided to do a 52-week project, um, carving one spoon every day, every week, sorry. And we just chose different uh, makers, different ideas. So these are some of those over here and we're going to uh, go through. This particular one was um, a, a spoon that I just loved to follow the grain of the wood. So in this one I just stayed with how the wood was moving and put a ball in it. Um, the, the brief of that week was just a, a shape like this and I just wanted to make something a little bit different. It looks like a little boat on a river to me. Um, this is this is butternut, uh, no butternut, uh, it's actually, uh, gosh, I forget the name of it, uh, rose, uh, red bud. It's a beautiful, beautiful wood to carve. This is um, a butternut, which is uh, very close to walnut, but it's a little bit different. It's a stirring spoon. These three are uh, from what I initially thought was a spalted maple in Transylvania, right on the hill where I grew up actually, uh, in the back of the building where I grew up as a child, and it's, uh, it turns out to be elm, and it's really wonderful. I mean, the color in it is just stunning. So many different variations of green and brown. This was also part of the project. It's a um, spalted birch. Um, the back of the wood was one side of it, the billet was like this, and I just, often when I carve, I decide to follow the grain of the wood and just uh, in, be in dialogue with that, so I follow that on the other side and it turned out to be like this on the back. Um, these are some, uh, this is one last of the ladle that I have, I've been carving ladles quite a bit. Um, this one is cherry and playing with some coal rosing here. These are salad server sets, these two. Um, this one, it's a little bit more of a contemporary, um, playful, different kinds of shapes kind of mirroring each other and creating one shape all together. So I'm just playing with ideas like that. These are um, I saw these ones um, made a similar shape in metal and I often try to translate wood, um, metal into, into wood or, or ceramic into wood and just play with different shapes. There are great places of inspiration. And these ones, oh, this is actually probably one of my favorites from the project. It's a flower scoop and it was inspired by a photo that was about just like this in a semi-profile on the internet that I found uh, looking for shapes for inspiration and I just thought oh how does that look to make and it was just so beautiful so curvy in all directions everything about this is curvy so it was really wonderful challenge um, these ones are some coffee scoops that I started making recently um, just inspired by different architecture pieces. I just loved that, that shape uh, for left-handed and for right-handed in this case. Um, spalted birch and this is beautiful walnut from, from Wales actually from my friend Sean that helped me with find some wood. And that's actually one piece, right? Yeah, this is one piece. It's carved um, in one piece and I've done it like this and also um, just tapering out a little bit um, so it almost looks like it's coming out of the wood and out of the bowl but this is yeah this is in one piece um, and these ones are also part of the project not this one um, but these are also part of the project this is one uh, another example that I really like I love working like that uh, when I just let part of the wood speak. So this is exactly how the wood split when I, when I uh, cut the, the billet. And I just loved, it was just looking like this 
on the side of the profile. And I thought, wow, how beautiful that would be on a handle. It's the same rosebud, like this one here, the same kind of wood. So it looks really pretty that way to me. Um, this is a spoon made by, um, or inspired by a spoon made by Anya, and I just really loved that shape. And um, walnut, this is from walnut. This one is probably the only one that I've ever carved uh, from dogwood, a beautiful, beautiful tree if you have seen it. If you're from the Uni United States, you know um, it's such a beautiful wood that flowers just with no leaves and it's just covered in pink flowers so it's just such a beautiful tree it's interesting how when i started carving you know at the beginning i just saw i just saw trees every tree looked the same to me like it's just bark i didn't quite know about them and to have this opportunity i remember at some point during the project of making spoons for the people in the city just having split wood and just seeing how it actually looks on the inside and every one, every single one is different, even from the same tree. It was just such a beautiful way for me to connect with nature and see the trees around me when I would walk in the park, just have a completely different understanding of, wow, I got to see how they look on the inside and they just, yeah, it amplified my connection with nature. Um, this one is uh, a spoon inspired by Tobias. It's, he's a wonderful, wonderful maker. It's um, made by maple, from maple. It's a really, some uh, inclusions here and that I kept in the wood, they're really pretty. This one is an um, old Norwegian spoon that was, gosh, probably my, the most intricate design in the whole project with these tiny little finials and it's made from cherry. And yeah, I really loved doing this. It was quite a challenge. Um, this one is inspired by um, Marianne. And you would probably recognize the beautiful bowl that she does. It's this alder. And it's really pretty to see those medullary rays in alder. This one was um, an African spoon that was a pain in the butt to make, to be honest. <laughs> it's because of everything is in one piece. And I don't really know why, they, why, why they're made. They probably are some ritual spoons. They, um, it was something that my brother found that he thought I would love to give it a try. So yeah, you kind of, this particular lip, it's actually so comfortable to hold. And if I were to make it again, I would make the handle longer and just eat like this with it. It's just such a wonderful design. This one is also walnut, really cranky, <laughs> cranky little spoon. This one here is a beautiful butternut that was inspired by a pebble. And um, I love how it has these little flecks that almost looks like sun, sun on the beach. And this is a pebble shape, a beach pebble. And I added this for, for an, a touch of water inspiration. This was inspired by a, uh, an orchid, a flower. So this would be the petal. And um, these are some details from the flower itself. And I tried to keep the, there is a little bit of a, a raised point in the leaf. And here as well, that's, yeah, I tried to stay as true to the leaf as I could. Um, and these are also, this is a Japanese style spoon that was very beautiful to make. Um, and these really gentle transitions were quite a learning point for me. Um, this one is also alder. This one is the Japanese um, set of spoons that were made out of metal in the photo that I found and I just tried to make them in wood so they look very delicate like I imagine eating some hors d'oeuvres with, with these they're very very small this is a camping spoon um, the theme was a camping spoon and I tried to make uh, what I call a spife <laughs> which is a spoon with a knife with a butter knife so I figure you can eat most everything with a spoon and sometimes you might need a knife so that might be a good addition for camping. 
This one is also inspired by Japanese uh, maker that it's really wonderful. Um, this one is inspired by uh, Kramer, which on Instagram is Kramex. It's really wonderful, wonderful maker as well. Um, this is a maple. It's really pretty, spalty. This is um, the a theme. The theme was a spoon with bark on, and I just love. At, like I said earlier, just love leaving accents of the original piece of wood. So this is the, the actual bark on which almost looks like a little eye. Um, so yeah, that's that. And these ones are, we're kind of done with the project spoons. These are just spoons that I started making for myself, what I have here to show. Um, and this is again, just leaving some of the original the split part of the wood and just some axe marks and this I think it's um, I think it's birch this one is Romanian Transylvanian apple which is just the apple core the apple heartwood and it's such a beautiful color and we're just playing with the different back transitions on this one more of a dessert spoon this is Romanian these two of them are um, a Romanian olive wood of sorts, which is, I have never carved olive wood before really, or the real olive wood. So this feels very like, the, the flecks in it are just really pretty. It's very light and very porous, but quite lovely in the, in the colors and the texture. And these are um, some spalted uh, birch spoons that I was playing with coal rosing and um, had different different shapes. This is also leaving some of the billet marks on it. Same with this one. This is playing with the decorating on the cambium that you can leave off. It's just a little sunrise. <laughs> so there is that. And lately, lately I've been um, carving a lot of Romanian spoons, traditional Romanian spoons. And what I've been doing is taking the or spoon that's mainly now carved in Romania as a cooking spoon, even though we've used to carve quite a bit of Romanian eating spoons, um, it was just so much part of the tradition and what people would do. They would just carve whatever they need or they would make whatever they would need for themselves. So I've taken the shape and added a bit more curves to it because I I like to make shapes a bit more curvy and flu flowy. And as the patterns, usually in Romania, the patterns on the spoons can be very much like Welsh spoons, very big and bold and um, not so curvy and not much crank in them. They're very much done for decoration usually. So what I've done is take patterns that are on the the folk costumes or the folk wear that people still use, it's very much present in Romania for people to use traditional hand-sewn, hand-decorated um, way of just clothes. And I've taken a lot of those patterns and put them on spoons because I really want to honor um, those parts of the traditions in my country. And um, also, things that are part of my own particular family, like both my grandfathers were woodworkers and I didn't quite know that until later on. And my mom was very much, a pa a, had a passion about the hand-sewn clothing. My grandmother used to sew a lot of hand-sewn stitch, carve stitch, uh, cross stitch, I think it's called, um, patterns on tablecloths and things like that. So I just wanted to take all of that and and bring it into what I make currently and honor the traditions of my family of my culture. So um, yeah, these are all patterns inspired by Romanian patterns and also some of them that are just me playing with the wood. For example, this is creating some patterns in the lighter part of the wood and leaving the darker uh, hardwood come through so it almost looks like it's three-dimensional. Um, this is something that's 
almost the same kind of playing with decorating just one part of the heartwood. Um, this is a pattern in Romania as well and I just added a little bit of flower just to create some story behind the pattern leave the person kind of wondering why that's there so I like doing that this is similar to again playing with the, this is more of a traditional um, carving in Romania at the beginning the spoons are quite simple just a few lines and a few notches on the ends and I just added some patterns um, this is also just something that I a design that I really liked this is very much a Romanian pattern as well so is this, but it's playing more with the grain and I kind of brought it down into the side of the handle, the side of the spoon. These I haven't, this is how it looks like when I just draw, um, free draw the, the pattern and then these are to be carved. They're not quite done yet. Um, and yeah, we keep going. The, the wood, most of the wood here is apple, this one, um, actually all of them except this is apple and you can see and these ones are, are birch but a lot of them are apple and from the same exact billet so you can see just the different kinds of colors in one piece of wood and same with these are the same patterns chip carved some of this is coal roast and um, yeah some of them are very intricate. It just takes a whole day or more to carve, but it's been quite meditative to actually do this. So in terms of the <clears throat> tutorial, um, is there a particular style of spoon then out of the ones that you've shown here that we can yeah. speak carving? Yes, we actually were going to make another video and we're going to take, make a Romanian spoon like this and we're going to Co car car chip carve on the one that I will make in that video and we're going to do a, a Romanian traditional Romanian pattern of chip, chip carving on the handle similar to what's here but a completely different design and then we're going to take this particular spoon and we're going to do another video and we're going to call rose a Romanian traditional Romanian design on it Perfect. So those will be the two follow-up videos. Yeah. Um, so in this video, we're going to be carving this style of spoon then. Yes, we're going to be carving this style of spoon. And we're going to do um, the lip as well, which is a very much a Romanian style. And yeah, we're going to do that together. So Andrea, we're going to begin the process. Yes. So just as we do that, um, I have a question for you on the topic of wood selection. This is something I'm intrigued by and no doubt those that are watching. And that is in Romania, what kind of access to wood do you have and what types mm. of wood do you have access to? Yeah, um, the forest around where my town is, um, there's quite a lot of wood. Um, a lot of tree surgeons, a lot of people that cut wood for um, burning in the stove. So it's quite easy to just ask around and see who might have an extra couple of logs. The wood that is most prevalent in Romania is beech. Lots of people in the UK are so happy because they love beech. <laughs> um, it's much harder than the beech here actually. And uh, some other wood, of course, fruit trees, um, walnut, it's a little bit harder to find, but there is a lot of birch and most of the woods that are here um, in, in the wild. Like here, I think people have a lot of um, manicured gardens or, or private gardens where they like to cultivate, like Deborah loves to try all these different kinds of trees. And, um, but in, the simpler ones are, are the ones that I would find or I have access to, yeah. Apple, walnut, beech, maple, lots of maple, which is one of my favorites. And so today, what are we going to be carving with? So today we have a piece of cherry um, that a dear friend of mine gave me to use. And yeah, this is plenty, plenty a good size for a spoon that we're going to make. And it's quite thick enough so you can have the, the flow in the handle to the bowl and uh, long enough for that. It's about 
what, six, ten, ten inches. So yeah, that's what we're going to work with. It's a slightly spalted, but quite pretty. Yeah. Uh, so where would you like to begin? So the first thing, since this one has a bark on, I'm first thing that I'm thinking of is where do I position the the spoon? Do I position it on the side? Do I position it uh, bark up? Um, this piece is quite wide, so that means that I can put the spoon right here and have those beautiful rings inside. Um, I'm not sure which one is tangential and radial. All I know is that if you put the spoon bowl to hold the bark, then you have those beautiful rings in the bowl. So I think we can take advantage of that. So the first thing that I do when I work with a spoon, I try to have a billet that allows me to create the curves that I want to create and the shape that I want to create. So in this case, this piece here is quite flat, which is great. If I work on the wood, it's quite stable. The only ones, ang the only angles that I will take, I'm going to take a little bit of these corners. I'm thinking in advance when I'm going to cut into the crank of the spoon, the billet will need to stay flat and right now it's not quite stable. So we're going to remove the bark and then cut those corners, just ax them out with the ax and then we're gonna start actually making a spoon out of this. So this is just preparing the, the billet beforehand. So I have an ax here that I'm borrowing. Traveling, it's like, I have no, none of my tools with me. So it's been quite an experience to get accustomed to different tools. So this is just a, a wonderful wood tools ax that works great. It's a wonderful beginner's ax. If you ever want to carve, you can definitely pick one of these up. It's sharp and quite stable. So of course, when you're axing, just be mindful of where your hand is how you're supporting the billet. This particular axe block has this raised piece that it's wonderful to lean your wood against so you don't have to hold onto it, which allows for stability and also it helps for your body so you don't have to put a lot of pressure into stabilizing the wood you're working with. So definitely if you have that, use it. So I'm just taking the bark off and also creating a flat surface. I'm not going to create a flat surface all the way to the ends, just about however much I need for the spoon. So I'm thinking ahead of time, how wide will the bowl be and axing the bark out about that much. And just going in a straight line. It doesn't have to be super straight because we're going to ax into the crank there anyway. So. Yeah, it's going to be beautiful. You can see the spalt, slight spalting and oxidation in the wood. So it's a beautiful piece that I hear sat a lot into some water. So if you have wood that's sitting quite a bit, you can get really lovely color into it. So here's the handle piece, the handle part. So I'm not going to go too wide. And another question I get some questions about this. Well, how do I decide where do I put the bowl and where do I put the handle? And in this case, the billet is quite even on both sides, maybe slightly thicker here. So just because it's slightly thicker here and I know that my spoon has a little bit of a crank in it, I'm going to put the bowl on this side. It doesn't matter quite as much because the difference is not that that obvious, but if this were much thinner, I would definitely put the bowl where you have the thickest piece of the wood. So we're going to put the bowl here and the handle here. So now that we took the bark off, I'm going to take these corners off. I can go just keeping in mind how thick do I want to, the bowl to be and leaving maybe a quarter of an inch on each side. So just taking that much off of each side. And when you cut onto a straight line, just use those chop, chops all the way across and then take those off and then kind of work your way through like that. If your piece of wood is really straight, you can definitely start all the way at the top 
and just take it down in one piece. But I don't always trust that the wood is completely straight. So I just like to take little bits at a time. So we did one side. And these sides, these two sides, I'm going to try to keep rather flat. They don't necessarily have to be parallel, but just flat so that the billet stays flat and doesn't wobble when I put it on the side. So that's what we have now, something like this. So now that we, we've created the billet that we can, it's pretty much our blank surface. I'm going to establish the crank of the spoon and I'm going to, so what I usually do when I make a spoon, I don't use a template and I'm going to start drawing it on and if your, if your viewers, if you would like a template of the spoon we're going to make, definitely can do that. Is that something you would like me to do? Um, if you're able to create that, that would be fantastic. Oh, great. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So we can just create something um, that's representative to what we're going to carve today. So then when you watch this, if you want to give it a go, you can definitely do that yourself as well. So now we have the piece of wood. So I'm thinking ahead of time how how long this is going to be, how long the spoon is going to be on the wood before I draw it. Before I start actually drawing the shape, I'm just going to do the, the dimensions of the bowl, just some two lines, and thinking about the handle as well. So I free draw usually most of the times, and I'm thinking the bowl, I'm trying not to put it straight at the ends, just in case there are some fractures in the wood, so I'll probably start here. And the bowl, I kind of like it about this size. And then what I do, I just <laughs> use this as a ruler. And I'm taking this si the size of the bowl and I'm moving it up one time, two times, and a half. So that's usually how I do the Romanian spoon about this tall. And this will be the handle sometimes maybe a itty bitty, just by eye I adjusted, so this will be the bowl. So now I'm not going to draw the spoon, but I'm going to carry, this will be the bottom of the bowl. So the crank, it's usually about a third in or two thirds from the tip. So this will be the tip, this will be the bowl. So the crank will be about here. So I'm going to draw this line and carry it onto the sides so that way, I'm going to axe the crank this way, so I'm going to draw it on this side. So if you, if you were to remember, if you keep the bowl down of the spoon and you put it towards you, this is the side where you're going to draw the profile, if you want to draw the profile of the spoon. So to draw the crank, I'm just thinking, so this is the tip of the spoon, this is the bottom of the spoon, so we're going to now think of the flow. So the Romanian spoon is usually, it's a, in three parts. Usually you have the bowl and there is a little bit of a neck and then the handle. So it's the neck that's going to be, um, the neck is going to be the thinner part of the spoon and then it sort of flares out into the handle that we're going to decorate. So that's what I have in mind. This is also where the spoon ends. So here we have the bowl and I'm going to kind of roughly give it that, that shape that the Romanian spoon has. And it's sort of, this is the top part of the, of the spoon. So it kind, sort of comes that, kind of like this. And I'm trying to keep, actually not make it so flat. So scratch that as I'm doing this with you. I'm actually wanting it to have some sort of a 
um, a crank and a tilt all together. If I were to draw it just following this line, the spoon itself, when you hold it, will be rather flat in your hand, kind of like a pencil. And how you can tell is that the tip of the bowl, of the bowl is aligned with the tip of the handle, the, so the, the end of the handle. So what I really want is to tilt the handle this way and then have the bowl come up a bit. So then when you hold it towards your mouth, it just comes um, towards you rather than you have to really lift it into your mouth. So scratch this. We're going to take all this out. So the, the tip of the, the top of the spoon will be this. Now I need to add the curves into it. So I'm going to do a little bit of a curve here where we're going to hold it, like our thumb is going to fit in here. And this is going to be that raised belly uh, into, the, um, into the neck of the spoon, right where the bowl starts. And this will be the bowl itself. And there is that lip as well. And we're going to put it right here. So the neck is actually going to come down a bit. And this is the bowl. So now we have the top part of the spoon. It's like this, and here's the handle. Now we're going to think of the bottom and think, keeping in mind the thickness. So the handle will come this way. This is the bottom of the bowl. This is the crank right here. So I'm coming down, leaving some thickness into the thinnest part of the spoon, which will be that neck area right before the, after the bowl starts. And then I'm coming down to the lowest part of the spoon, which is the deepest part of the bowl. This is going to be a little bit thinner when we actually carve it, just because you don't want such a deep bowl. It's going to be a little bit thinner than that, but that's sort of the idea. So that's going to be the profile. Great, so now that we have the profile, we're going to actually carve into the crank. So what I'm going to, what that means is that I'm going to take all this wood out right here and just create the crank of the spoon, the shape. So we're going to do that first. I'm going to tell you ahead of time what we're going to do next. Next we're going to take out the bottom and then we're going to take out this piece of wood. And then we're going to transfer and do the drawing on the top so we can actually take this piece of wood that's all around the spoon. So everything that's not a spoon we're going to axe out. First starting with the profile and then we're going to do the top part. So. In order to do the crank, we know that this is the deepest, the deepest part of the spoon is here. So we're actually I'm adjusting this a little bit because of the, of the drawing. So it's something like this from the profile. So this will be the deepest part of the spoon, right here. So all this wood, we're going to take out. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to keep this line in mind, which is going to be right here, and create a valley on this surface, keeping this as the lowest point. So what I'm doing, ideally, is keeping this surface of the wood parallel. So when I'm axing, I'm not going to ax. It's really easy when you ax following this profile to tilt the wood and the billet and ax this way, taking more on this side than this side. But what I'm actually wanting to do is look at this profile, but try to keep the axing parallel. So this surface will be parallel um, will, will be at 90 degrees to this, sort of. So I'm not 
tilting it this this way or this way it's going to be coming parallel um, to the ground let's just say so with not too much talking let's get into it so I'm going to start just creating some stop cuts it's basically a stop cut some people um, use a saw and you can actually totally do that just saw all the way down in maybe a little bit off and then that will be easy for you to take all this wood out without taking the bowl with you but you can achieve the same result by axing some stop cuts and then gently work my way into that stop cut and then I'm going to do that again so this is what I'm doing from the side I'm just going down into the wood and then taking a little bit off a little bit deeper just kind of work my way through by taking some from here some from here and just slowly going deeper and deeper and this is where it's a little bit more difficult to to cut because you are going right across the fibers so you don't have to go straight down necessarily just a little bit off so that way you have a better chance of of going down into the wood without creating small fractures So I'm following, just, I keep looking at the drawing that I did on the sides. And using that as, as the guide. So from the profile, we already took quite a bit. So I'm slowly getting closer to the line and a little bit deeper into here. Now I'm going to adjust the drawing just slightly just because I find that maybe it's a bit too much crank. So I'm just adjusting, I apologize if this is getting to be really really thick of a line, but it also helps what helped me now was just not looking at the drawing and just axing and then looking at it again with fresh eyes, so to speak. So if you take a little bit of a break from what you've drawn and you come back to it and you're like, oh wait, that looks a little bit too deep. So you can definitely adjust all the way through. You don't have to be set into one design and as you're, as you're working halfway through, you can change your mind and just adjust it slightly. Because you might not see something that you that you see uh, like a few minutes after. So I'm quite close to the top here, so I, I can't I don't want to go any further down. And I'm going to try to take this little piece out. And sometimes the wood, as you can see, it's not a straight line and the grain, because this is such a straight billet, goes straight down. So if I were to ax starting right here, I would, I would take this whole thing off. So sometimes what I do, if the wood lets me and I'm going to check, that doesn't always, is as I ax, instead of going up and down like you normally would ax, I try to gently, ever so slightly, it might not even be visible, I'm going to exaggerate this and just flick it out as I go into the cut. So that way, I'm almost carving an imaginary line, or not imaginary, because we've really drawn it here. So just following that line with my eye and allowing my brain to tell my hand to really do that movement. So I'm gonna see if... So you can see that as I'm axing and I'm doing this, I'm able to create a curve into the handle and I'm holding the axe with my finger 
because that allows me to really have a lot of control. If I were to hold it from here, I can't quite control the, um, the head of the axe very well, but if I hold it from here and from here, the whole thing is an extension of my arm, and I really have much more control over it. So you can see here that I'm coming up against the grain, but it's, it's still quite okay. If I feel like I'm, it's, this is something absolutely you can do with a knife. So um, I pref prefer to do as much work with the axe as I can instead of uh, working with a knife. And that's mainly because um, as I was working before with the spoons and having to do so many, my hands got really tired. So uh, I don't have very muscular hands. So if I can get away with using the weight of the ax to do the work, I'll take it. It doesn't matter if it takes me a little bit longer. So we're almost there with the shape of the spoon. You can see we slowly, we're following this line. Some of it I'm not, I'm going to take down with the, with a knife, but we're basically there. We just need to take now this piece off. So we are here at the crank. So that's what we did so far. So now I'm going to tilt it on the side and just take this. Um, that's why we wanted the surface to be flat. So now when I hold it down, I can have it be rather solid. And this is quite a, an intimidating move for some, especially for people who are beginning, um, just because it doesn't feel quite, quite stable and it's a, a very awkward angle. So what I'm doing here, I'm just leaning a lot of the weight actually of my upper body into this hand to keep this quite steady. My weight is on this leg as well, so almost all my weight is on the left side. And I'm just bracing. The reason why I'm standing a step down here is because the <laughs> this is Deborah's block. And Deborah's um, a little bit shorter than I am, and this is fit for her. So I cannot really use it, otherwise I'll be really bent forward and it'll kill my back. So we've adjusted it to put it up on the step. So, but it's the same thing if you were on a flat surface. You just stay really solid on the left side and use your right leg to just create balance and stay right above the piece of wood you're working. Because what I'm wanting to do is just use that up and down motion here. The idea is that I'm wanting to create a flat line, if you were to imagine going straight down to the axe, all the way to the other side. So that's what I'm wanting to do this to be, to be um, as straight as possible going down. And the reason why that is, if you look at the billet here, what we're, look, what we're working on is the surface of the, of the spoon this is the one side of the spoon, this would be the other side of the spoon. So you want that to be parallel to the handle. If you're axing it and it's a little bit tilted, then you'll have to then adjust it. It's not a big deal, but it's just a good practice to start thinking that ahead of time and trying to create the surfaces so you don't give yourself more work in the end. So leaning onto it, it's all solid. It's a little bit off to, from the edge, so then when the axe hits the ground, if I were to miss, it just stops into the block of the wood. So I'm starting taking a little bit from the, the tip of this corner and just working my way towards this line. And I'm also working with, whereas before, I was working with this part of the, hand, the axe, now I'm working more with this end and almost if you were to imagine that you're almost like you're slicing through the wood. If I were to cut this way, first of all, I might hit up here, so I can only really use 
this corner, this upper part of the axe, yeah? So just slowly taking it all the way down and then taking a little bit more and taking it all the way down in as much straight line as you can. And sitting on top of the wood also helps you to see um, that you're going on the straight line. So that also helps. You're using both your body posture and your eyes as you're working. So you're going something like that and just work all the way down. And this is a little bit wobbly, maybe because the block is a little bit wobbly. There we go. I'm going to adjust this angle because I want it to be more flat than it is. So this is again, you just always adjust the piece of wood to work with you. There we go. So from the corner, the top, and of course your elbow is, your left elbow is out of the way, so your whole forearm is out of the way. at the line. I'm going to take a little bit more off just to meet that valley that we created. And it's okay if you if you ax into it. And you can see that I'm bringing the wood next to me because I, I just, my hand is just here doing the work. I started up and it was fine, but once I got, I worked towards that area, I'm just going to bring it towards me instead of me going towards it. So using the very tip of the axe, I'm just going right into that valley. And here, just to adjust it and clean it up a bit, you can use the tip. And for things like this is why you want to leave a little bit extra on this side, just in case it breaks or in case it splits. And I can do the same on this side. Actually, so you can see better. Just slightly, just cleaning it up. So when I, I'm just rocking it right now. So when I um, start drawing it and when I work with it, then I just know that it's rather flat. So we have now the surface and the curve on the side. This is the spoon that we drew. It's similar, close to the line as you can. So now we can actually draw it on the top. Well, let's draw it on the top now, and then when we do the back side, we can actually, it doesn't really matter the order, we can, we can do either. Let, let's do this way, because we just said we're gonna do it this way. So I first take the bowl part. So what I'm doing now, I'm always looking ahead of the line. So a lot of the times people look as where they're axing, the spot where they're axing. What I'm actually doing when I'm trying to follow a line, I just go, I look ahead of it. I look ahead of where my ax is hitting and that's helping me stay close to the line. Almost like your brain will tell you which way to go. So. I'm starting with the spoon slightly tilted, and as I follow the line, I'm just lowering the piece of wood, and that's going to allow me to ax down. And that's just because I'm only axing, you'll see me tilt sometimes the ax, but ideally, you only want to go up and down. That's going to allow you to use the weight of the ax instead of having to work and hold it in a different way, and it's going to bring less tension onto the arm you're working with. So I'm taking the wood down and then I'm slightly lowering it. Gosh, I wish you would he be here that this cherry smells so good.
and just keeping a rather flat line. Of course, you can also go side to side. There are a lot of people who uh, create uh, three facets here. Another thing that I'm doing when I get all right to the tip, instead of hitting up and down, I use the same slicing motion. And I've been holding the X this way this whole time, particularly because it allows me to take those um, slices. So I'm really focusing on the tip of the X and just slicing with it. So this would be one facet, and this would be, if you were to do it, use facets, you can just very easily create three facets and then take the middle one all the way down. So at this point I'm going to check about how thin I am at this end. And because we didn't start all the way at the end, that's pretty good. I'm, I could probably go it's quite thick here, I could probably go quite a bit thinner. I'm going to take a little bit more. And the reason why I'm doing slicing motions at the end, it's because you're, you have a lot of compact, you can see the grain of the wood and how at the top here, you're working with quite short grain, so if you're using a slicing motion, you, re you, you uh, avoid creating splits and cracks. Okay, so we've done this part. Now we can just work on the handle. And I'm gonna take a little bit more here. And the reason why I stopped and took a little bit more is because I was, I felt it with my fingers. So I just keep checking sometimes. When we get towards the end of the final shape, you will see me do that quite a bit. So actually, now, instead of taking such a big piece of wood, such a big slice of wood off, I would rather draw the spoon and take these ends down because that's going to be less work. Instead of taking a flat piece of wood, I'll just start drawing it on the top and do the top profile. Great, so now we're drawing the top, the actual shape of the spoon when you look from the top. So we know that now that we axed this out, we don't have these marks anymore, but we have them on the side here. So we know that this is the bottom of the bowl, this is the deepest part of the bowl, and that's the top. So I'm going to just transfer those here so I know what's my shape of the spoon. This is the top of the bowl, and of course this is the, the uh, deepest part of the bowl. We knew this one. And the handle, this is where you, you can adjust and see, well, maybe the handle, now the handle looks pretty good. It's long enough. I'm going to keep it there. And if when you draw it, if after we draw it on the top, if it looks a little bit like you might want the handle longer, we can absolutely adjust that. The next thing that I do is I draw a middle line. And you can draw it by hand. Since this side is quite flat, you can do that carpenters move where you hold the pencil steady and you use these two fingers to prop them up against the wood and this kind of um, stays put and you slide it across all the way down so this feels that that's quite centered so now that we have the center line the next I'm going to draw the bowl and I start with the bottom of the bowl, kind of like that. And then I usually start on the left side, my left. Now the Romanian spoons have a tip, a point. Um, I like to not have that as pronounced because it doesn't feel very good. You can sometimes really hit the, your tongue with it 
when you eat it, so it does, when you eat with it, so it doesn't feel very good. So I try to mirror that. It doesn't always work, so that's when I turn it around and do it this way. And here I might make a little bit of a point, and that's when you, when I start adjusting. This feels a little bit too thick, but I kind of know to come in a little bit more. So I'm, I'm just looking at it now from all angles, and this I would want to bring it a little bit further down than the line. So that's the bowl. And now, it's probably, could probably be a little bit pointy and we can adjust that with a knife. So we, we talked at the beginning that the handle itself is in two parts. So the whole spoon is three parts. We have the bowl, that little belly of the, of the neck that we just said. Um, and then this is the flatter side of the, the, bowl, the handle where I put a little bit of a curve from the original design it's because it just feels better in the hand. So I'm going to mark this a little bit here. So that tells me that the neck is going to come up to this part up to this line right here and then from here it's going to flare out a little bit like so you and this is where we can play with the design but I want to make something that um, it's uh, something that you can do as well and we're going to make a template out of this so you can either have it from here all the way down flat, or you can just come slightly into a curve. This is really no, no rule. You can just adjust this. So there we go. This is the Romanian spoon. It's going to look like that from the profile and like this from the top. Of course, this we can adjust it, make it thinner if we want, and this is going to be a raised lip um, away from the bowl, so from the side this and the top of the spoon comes here and then there's a little bit of a lip and the handle goes into the spoon a little bit lower. So now what we are going to do is take everything that's not a spoon from the top and just remove that. So we're going to remove all this wood on both sides. And for the neck, we're going to do a stop cut a little bit, a few millimeters away from the neck. You can either do that with just the ax and just ax your way, just like we axed our way into the crank. You can pretend that this is a crank now, um, but it's easier to do it with a saw. So we're gonna put two stop cuts over here. And we're gonna do that first, and then we're gonna start axing all this out. Okay, so we have this folding saw, it's any saw would work, and I'm going to put this flat onto the surface that we're working on, and just start gently, don't need to push too hard, and I keep checking to see how far I've gone. Keeping the saw blade rather straight. Um, because if you tilt it too much, then you're going to axe into the back of your bowl. So it's trying to keep it as parallel to the surface as, as possible. And I'm going to do the same here. And I'm going to go back and say, once I finish this, um, why I've decided to do the cut here and not maybe lower. Or so. Now that we've done this, we've left a little bit. This will be the back of our um, handle. So if we were to tilt this, we would have come too close here. And um, that way it's safer. I'm gonna put this away. 
so why did I cut over there and not lower? So the reason why I did that is because this comes out of the spoon in a curve. And if I would have cut here, I mean, you could have cut closer to the bowl, but it would have been a little bit harder to, um, it would have be a little bit closer to, to, this, um, to this curve. And if, I, call, if I, call, I decide to cut at the lowest point of the curb, so if you look at the profile, this would be sort of the lowest point here. Even this could have been. So that's why I decided to put the, the saw cut over here. It's not a big deal if you leave a lot of wood on the side of the spoon, but okay, so now because I know how far in I can go with the axe, I can take all this wood out with more confidence. So I'm going to, because it's quite a thick piece of wood, I'm going to just take the edges off and then the corner, the, the corners I mean. So just take the corners, take this corner, and then take the facet. That allows me to feel into the wood and see where it wants to split. Um, and just make sure that I don't damage the form that I've created. And as you can see, we took down the drawing. So we're going to have to redraw that, which is great. Because um, it just helps you, um, it helps you get comfortable with drawing a spoon and it's probably one of the reasons why <clears throat> excuse me why I don't work with with templates is because I want my eye and my I want my eye to get used to seeing shapes and transferring shapes onto onto wood rather than relying on a shape that's pre-cut that I can just follow with a pencil so it's just easier that way it allows you to, to cultivate your creativity a little bit, really. And also work with the wood and see how the wood wants to move. So that's a good practice. I really encourage that. Okay, so I'm going to take this corner off. A little bit more. So I'm following the line of the handle, getting as close as I can, knowing that the wood goes quite straight. It's a quite predictable piece of wood that I know that if I hit, I've kind of gotten to know it now, and I know that if I hit a certain direction, it's going to go straight down if I hit across the grain. So it's helpful as you work with a billet you just kind of get to know it and so we're going to come now and ax the bowl I'm going to keep the handle as thick um, actually I'm going to ax the handle first and the reason is that the reason that is is because well there is no reason really I just you we could definitely ax the bowl and then the handle there's no rhyme. So here, because I know this, the grain is quite straight, I can hit right here with the axe, and I know that it's going to split. It'll be funny if it doesn't, doesn't. But I know that if I hit here, it's going to split all the way down. And I'm leaning the piece of wood up against this surface and making it more stable. And now I'm just tilting it, I'm just following the line. Here again, as I work with the more compact grain, I'm using the tip of the knife, the tip, the tip of the axe, and just using those slicing motions. And now we're going to go on to the other side, which is a bit more difficult because we can't see it. But I'm just checking. So 
So we are about as close as I can get. I would rather, I would take a little bit here, but it's not that. It's something that you can absolutely do with a knife at this point. This corner, I'm going to, instead of axing it, I'm going to slice into it. And I'm doing that now, even though we have quite a bit of a thickness here. I'm doing that now because when I'm going to take this thick part, I'm going, I want to take a little bit more off of here. I don't want to rest the spoon onto a very pointy head because that might, <clears throat> it might risk it breaking. So I'm using the bottom part of the ax to resting it onto this part, onto the tip, and just pressing down. And it's like a little slicing motion. It's like a guillotine. It's like a guillotine, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that way I, I just round it up a bit just so I can rest the spoon onto this point without it risking cracking. Just like that. So I'm going to do the bowl and take a little bit more off. It's a little bit maybe from this thickness and a little bit from the sides on both sides. So at this point, coming so close to the final shape of the spoon, before we start working with a knife, I'm starting to imagine the actual shape of it. So now I have in my head how I want it to look. How close do I come in on the edges? How deep do I really want to go into the bowl? How thick will be this, um, this neck area? How the, we, can, we can draw on it actually, and that would make it easier. So I'm going to draw um, on this end both ends actually, so you can both sides, so you can see as I'm axing. So this will be the bowl, and it's a, it looks rather flat, and to some degree it is because it feels better to use a flatter spoon. And this is where this is the saw mark. This will be the deepest part of the bowl right here. So something like that. And we're going to do the same thing on the other side, hopefully close enough. And that's where I, where, I, where I check. And because this surface is parallel to this surface, I can actually take measurements and see about, this is about how deep it's going to go here. And I make a mark here. It's about that deep. I'm going to make a mark. So then when I follow these lines, I am staying slight, like sort of on the same vicinity of a shape. So I'm also going to take a measurement of how deep the crank goes. I'm going to transfer it here. So something like that. Okay, something like this. So now we're going to ax out everything around this, particularly on the bowl. We're going to focus on the bowl. So I'm going to take these corners, following that line. And what I drew here, it's actually the deepest part of the, cur of the bowl. But the bowl is a curve, right? So this line here, it's actually going to be back here. So I could actually go thinner uh, on this side, on the actual side. I hope I'm making sense, but we'll see, we'll see how, what I mean here. So I'm taking a bit more from the center and then going onto the sides just starting to shape that curve and also keeping in mind that this here it's flat the line is flat but what I want it to look like will be something like like this just ever so gently so I don't want to take too much here 
just keeping in mind that this line is going to turn into a slightly curved one. So I'm going to do the same on the, sa on the other side. Just taking the corner, just going gently because you have now a lot, some, quite a bit of compact grain and particularly cherry is notorious to split when it gets to be a little bit more dry and even though this has been soaking when we're starting to be outside and it's a little bit windy it just starts to starts to get dry a bit too quickly so this is where I start fiddling and I'm pretty happy with the bowl like this and I'm going to start working my way from the deepest part of the bowl all the way to the handle. So um, I'm going to start right here and take these corners and here I can I can change the grip of my axe because I know I can hit harder because I have quite a bit of wood to work with. So when I want precise work, I just get closer to the head of the, of the handle of the axe and actually hold it like this. When I want more force into the head and I want it to have more gravity, I just move a little bit further down onto the handle. So now, I'm trying to follow this line on both sides. And I'm doing the same thing as I was doing where I slightly flick it outwards as I go into this little valley. It doesn't feel very, it doesn't look very obvious, but that's what I'm doing and I'm going quite thin because well why not I have the axe the axe here it can do the work for me so I can definitely make use of that okay so I'm doing the same thing on this side and then we're going to have a little bit of a raised part in the middle that I'm just taking not too much just So this is what we have now from the profile. And I need to take a little bit more from here, definitely. Just because it's a bit too bulky here. So just gently on both sides, just working my way from the center or the sides to the center. Just keeping in mind that in the back here, I actually want to keep a little bit of a thickness just from the design of the spoon. We're going to take some more out of here. A little, a little bit more. But we can do that with a knife. Um, just because... I don't know why. Sometimes you... Sometimes I can feel in the wood when it just feels a little bit more not as stable, not as it's just not as strong, maybe because it's spalted. It just feels a little bit like, it's a bit softer than the cherry that I'm used to. So I'm going to take some of these corners and I've, I'm adjusting um, every time, depending on how the grain is orienting. You just saw me that I s turned the spoon around is because I'm working from the highest point down into the, along the grain, just from the highest point down. The grain, you can clearly see the grain going parallel. So I'm working, this will be the highest point of these curves. If you imagine this is a hill and I'm going down, I'm slicing across these fibers. If I were to come up, up, up it, I'm going to hit into the fibers of the wood, or if I were to come down from here towards the tip, 
I'm going to hit up into these grains of the, the direction it just will will break. So I feel like we are pretty close. I'm going to take a little bit more here from the belly. Just using the tip of the axe really to carve as much as I can. And now we just need to take this part and axe out the tip or saw the, the tip of the spoon out. So now I'm going to take this piece of wood out, knowing by now that this is quite a straight billet and the line, if I hit it, is going to go either straight down or just slightly that way. So I'm not going to be too uh, adventurous and hit all the way from the top. Even knowing that, I just learned that there's quite a risk of I don't know, the wood just does what the wood does and I don't want to risk splitting um, right across or right, uh, right through it. So I'm still going to use the same, the same um, gentle taps, but not as powerful where I just get close and then I start tilting the ax to break the fibers. And then I'm going to do that the same, just tilting it. Staying close to the line. And then I'm doing some bump cuts to break the fibers. Because I don't want to not even touch this part with the axe because cherry is so sensitive to that and any really any touch there might create create a fracture that would later on just move when it dries and just surprise you after we've worked so much on a spoon and it's fine to hit this way because you're, you're hitting across the fibers. There's nothing really there to, to crack. And I'm going to get even closer to the line. Just use the spoon as, as a guide, the drawing. I'm going to turn it around and work around. And the reason why I turned it around is because we did that slight curve onto the handle. So it's not, ter it's not perfectly straight. So I just want to follow that and go from, again, the highest point down, even if it's just that much of very, very little curve. But I just want to not risk it again. So there we are. Now I'm going to take this, these two parts out, which is always the most nerve-wracking part for most, most of us who are carving or have just started carving. I'm going to slightly tilt this just because I want to make use of, of this higher part of the, or, or even this would work. So if you have a, t a chopping block, definitely make a little notch here, make a little V, and you can easily do that with the ax just going from one side to the other. That really helps to rest your spoon and ax the surface much easier than if you were to hold it up and just um, use your hand to stabilize it. It's so much more stable this way. So I am going up and down. I positioned it in a way that I can just slice right through it going up and down. Now because I'm going around the curve, I need to bring it up a little bit. So then if I hit up and down, it just sort of follows that curve. And then I'm going to tilt it up, bring it towards me again. And here I'm being a little gentle and the same, just bring it higher. There we go, just like that. 
and I'm going to do the same on this side. Just you can I can't quite see, so I have to check and keep checking. like that. And now is where you can just fiddle with it, but we don't have much to fiddle with. Just going to thicken a little bit the neck here. We can just thin it out a bit here. And pretty good. I'm going to check on the curve. Is it happy? Do I want to take a little bit more? And no, this is something that we can definitely do with the knife. I'm going to take a little bit from the thickness, make it a bit more flat, and now we need to take this out. You can either take it out with a saw, or since I have the axe in my hand, I can easily just, again, slicing motions. And it's good practice, you know, even if you have your saw, and it's good practice because things like this, where you have to really follow a short line, this is where it just creates a good, it's a good lesson to be precise and make sure that you want to hit where you want to hit with the axe. So give that a go. Like don't rely all the time on, on the tools that you have handy. Of course do, but this is really a, a, a great time to practice and so. Yeah, and there we have it. Now we're going to go to the knife work. So Andrea, with the axe work complete, what's the next part in your process? Right, so now we're going to do um, the knife work and I'm going to go through how I approach making a spoon and in this case it's just a Romanian eating spoon, a Romanian traditional eating spoon. So the first thing that we're going to do is work on the profile and just making sure that this whole area, the side of the spoon, is basically the final shape of the final spoon. And I'm going to clean this up and make it a flat surface that it's perpendicular to the top view. So we're going to follow the line that we drew to the final shape of the spoon. And I'm going to do that with pretty much every step of making the spoon. And the reason why I'll do that is because I want to set myself up for success and not have to go back and fix it and adjust things. So. Um, most of the steps that we're going to go through are going to be aiming to be the final shape of the spoon. So I'm going to start flattening this whole area and getting a little bit closer to the line. When we axed, we got close but not as close to the final line, so we're going to just do that for now. And What knife are you using? Oh, yeah, so I've been traveling and this is a knife I, I got from um, Peter Kovac and it's actually a really, really good knife. I've carved so many spoons with it so far and I haven't, it hasn't chipped, it hasn't, it's, it just holds its shape, it's, it's a, a sharpness quite well and the handle is fantastic as you know, Peter is really good at doing handles. So. Yeah, highly recommend it. It's just a regular Sloyd knife, but um, he started making them and I, I wanted to try one and got one. That's the only tool that I have with me that is mine. The rest of them are going to be uh, some borrowed tools from, from Deborah. Very accessible ones, like wood tools, really wonderful hook knives. Okay, so we're going to go through, I usually start um, on just by habit. I start on the right side of the bowl and I usually do the bowl first and then I'll move into the handle and the handle I'll do almost completely on both sides and then I'll go back into the bowl 
and do the back of the bow first and then we're going to do the hollowing and I'll tell you uh, why uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly doing it like that. So um, the, you're going to see me use various grips in, in, the, in this whole process. Probably not enough of them and not enough variation. I've just gotten accustomed to doing it a certain way and it's uh, one of my practices now to, to try to incorporate even more grips. But um, I'll just talk through about what I'm doing and how I'm using the knife. So maybe that will be helpful for some of you. So this is, of course, the chest um, push uh, grip. I don't actually know the full-on terminology, but where you, when you, when you work with a spoon, with every single grip that you're having, you're basically creating a vise with your either your fingers or in between your chest and your your hand because you want to stabilize the spoon in some way or another so every single grip that you're going to see me use and you know probably already it's creating a vise to stabilize the spoon and then using your fingers or your hand or whatnot to work with the knife so in this case in this particular um, grip I'm creating a vise between my hand and the, my chest and you can position this wherever this is comfortable depending on your eyesight it can be higher up <laughs> mine is getting higher up as I, <laughs> as I go through this or uh, lower depending on how it feels comfortable and I'm tilting the spoon um, depending on what side I'm working on and this way because I'm working here I am slightly tilting it and the reason why I do that is because I want this hand to be at a comfortable angle. I don't want it to be like this, it's not safe. I just want this hand with my elbow close to my chest to be at a very comfortable angle. So I'm rotating this spoon accordingly. And I'm using these fingers to, um, and slightly rotating this hand to just go around the neck here. And at any point as I'm using any grip, I'm really listening to the wood and feeling where it starts uh, fighting me. So here, like I'm, I'm noticing that I'm, I'm really, I mean, I could, if I were to be stubborn, go through, but I'm literally going up against the grain. So I know to stop there. And I'll just do some of, some of that. Um, just working around this line and just following this line around the neck and looking at this particular curve that's following from the bowl into the neck quite fluidly. There are other ways that you can do this spoon. Of course, um, it's you can be more creative if you want to and do a complete stop uh, here and do a straight angle like at 90 degrees but I really like the flow particularly when you have a flow into the spoon on the back side and on the handle it would be really nice to maintain that flow on the top view as well so I'll just keep switching from this this is another one another grip different it's the thumb push where I just hold the spoon in between these fingers and up against the knuckle, my, the, uh, is, are these the knuckles? No, the, my palm, the begin, the end of my palm. And I grip it like this. This is my vise. And I push with this, with this thumb and also pivot at the same time. So there are all these ways in which you get accustomed to to use the knife either pushing with the thumb or having the thumb still and moving this hand. So whatever you find useful, use that. It, it's, there's no really written rule. So when I do the bowl, I do one side and then I'm trying to mimic the other side. That's how I keep symmetry. So if I were to continue this 
and continue it this way, then I'll have to mirror that on this side. But I tend to prefer to work in segments. So if I'm finishing this segment, I'll just go and try to mimic that curve and on this other side, just to make sure that it's the same angle and the same symmetry. And that's easier for me to, to keep track of, of what I'm doing. So yeah, you can see that I'm holding it into my palm up against like really fixed here and I'm almost squeezing the spoon as I'm pressing the knife so I'm almost like doing this motion very gently so that's stabilizing it as I'm about to push the knife into it and just moving my knife around the shape around this line that I've drawn using just the tip of the knife because that's a very thin narrow area and allows me to turn a tight corner like imagine if you if you were driving a really tiny car you can tur turn tight corners much easier than with a really large car it's the same thing with a blade it's more limber when it's when it's thinner and shorter. So I'm just kind of going back and forth and trying to mirror these curves. And I, I won't get it exactly, but just close enough and we're going to check when the whole bowl of the spoon is, is done. I'm going to show you how to check for symmetry. I'm also looking I'm looking in this direction and sometimes if I turn it around and look at these curves from a different angle I'm able to see that they're not symmetrical or symmetrical. So now that I've done these I'm going to do these two and here where is where we're going to be mindful of the direction of the grain. It's changing right here. So if this were, if this is the profile we're working on. So this is the highest point and we want to go from the highest point down and from the, this highest point down. So you're going to see me work this way and then having to turn the spoon and work this way. This is another grip that you can use once, as long as you keep this finger. It's like peeling potatoes, but when you peel potatoes, you kind of peel potatoes a little bit up against your finger because your knives are not so <laughs> sharp like these. So don't do that. Just keep your finger away and just grip this knife in this so, sort of the motion, but not so much curvy, but more like in a straight line. That's the motion that you want to do while your finger, your thumb is out of the way. So when, when I push it towards me, it's just not going to cut into my my hand and that way you can go around this line this is a an, a an grip that actually i don't use very much but it's really helpful to change grips for this line i can use the same grip the thing is that i don't quite i'm not able to see so i'll just keep checking So we're going around. You can also do your the thumb push here. And just stop into a point line right at the top, but not too pointy. And here is those. It's that short grain right at the top, and it's a little bit. Um, harder to cut through and you you'll feel that in the knife always always try to pay attention to how the knife feels and you'll you'll be able to adjust your cut you'll get comfortable with with how your knife reacts you can just feel it through through your hand really it's 
you can get com comfortable with the sound that the wood makes and um, just the way that it slides through the grain. Just pay attention to that and you'll get more comfortable to that, those little nuances once you keep practicing the actual cut. Um, you might not be able to notice that at the beginning when you're trying to pay attention to how to hold your hand and all of that. But as you practice, you will definitely get used to it. So we did the profile. Now I was telling you that we, we want to check for symmetry. So how I do that, I usually hold it up against a light source or up against the sky, up against a bright area, a bright surface, but not so much background. So I'll just hold it up against the light and I can close one eye and just be able to see and then I'll turn it around upside down because then I can just see differently and to me this one looks like it's a little bit off on this corner like this little corner or corner this little belly it's a little bit too bloated so I'll just adjust it just ever so slightly we can definitely adjust this even more when we get into carving the back of the spoon a bit. So I want to carve, bring it closer to the handle. So I'll stop here with the bowl, this side, these fast, these, um, the side view of the bowl, that feels pretty good. So now I'm going to go into the handle and do the side view of the handle. And I'll just do on one side and then we'll go on the other side. Now here, the same when we axed, remember that there is this little curve that goes that way and this curve comes towards me. So we're going to follow that, keeping in mind that this is the highest point. So we're gonna go down into there and down from the highest point in both directions. It might not make that big of a difference, but I'll, we'll just follow that. So we're slicing into it just a little bit at a time. You don't have to take big chunks. You can just take several fine pieces. That way, it just allows you, it's easier on your body for one, and just allows you to be more, more precise. And also to listen to the wood, like I said, sometimes it might want to break or it might catch, the blade might catch in a certain way, so this really allows you to be, to stay close to the line. So we're staying as close to the line as possible. And here, these we can break off so I can see clearly. We just need to take now that little piece. So this is the deepest valley of, of this profile. And this is the place where it's a little bit more difficult. The neck of a spoon is always a bit tricky for people. So I'll just go slow. And sometimes I just break the fiber instead of pushing through it. So I don't risk cutting into the wood so that way just allows me to see what's underneath and slowly work my way into into that curve and I'm again using the knife towards the tip as much as possible because that allows me to go into the curve if I were to use this part which I can apply more force definitely but I can't quite turn into the curve as much with such a flat piece. It doesn't quite want to turn, but this is much more limber. So that's why we're using the tip. So I'll just keep checking. There is a little bit more and we might adjust this if, if the neck feels like it might look prettier, thinner. We can definitely adjust this, but for now pretty happy with this side. So we worked from here down and now I'm going to just do that bit in the up the other direction. 
just like that. So now we have this side and I'm going to mirror the same curve on the other side, hopefully. And this is going to, again, it's the side that you can't see when you work. So practicing to take a little bit at a time comes in handy when you work on the surfaces you can't see. Because if you have a habit of taking a lot of wood what at, at one time, then it's a little bit harder to to go into the surfaces that you then can't quite see. So I'm just taking a little bit and keep checking. I also use my fingers for symmetry um, because there's a lot of texture on top. I haven't worked on here yet. So just using these fingers just allows my brain keep looking in the middle line just allows me to feel, oh, this feels a little bit more curvy than this. And I'll just know to take, uh, to take that in more. And I'll show you, uh, I'll leave it like this, and I'll just show you when we do the top part and we clean that, you'll be able to see what I'm actually feeling with my fingers. So the same exact motion just going this I'm going a little bit up the grain here sometimes it's okay to do that when I'm working with just the tip of the knife not always but I'll just push it until it really lets me and then I'll turn it around and just gently take a little bit at a time I'm going to also look on the back to make sure that this thickness is also symmetrical. Even though I might take some of this and bring it lower, it's just a really good practice to keep, keep the symmetry going. And I have to adjust this a little bit, but we haven't started working on the back of the bowl, so I'll just leave it like that. Okay, so I feel like that's Maybe here I would need to take it a little bit in. But all these micro adjustments, I'll just leave for when we work on the top surface because then the sides will be even more noticeable. So I'll just leave that for now. Okay, now I'm going to do, so we work from here down, just like on the other side. I'll just take some from here that I just felt with my thumb. And then we're going to do this bit, just mirroring the same curve, just taking a little bit at a time. So basically from that point down to the very end, like that. And there, yeah, lots of micro adjustments, like this feels a little bit too bellied, this feels a little bit too bellied. So. Let's see if I'm right, but we're going to work on this part here as well. Just holding it firmly into my um, fist. I feel like grabbing a stick, just holding it. And it's the same motion where I grip as I push. I grip as I push, doing this basically. And I'm trying to round this a little bit to create some sort of a, a round and not so much of a pointy end, uh, end. And here, of course, be careful not to go into your knuckles. So that's why it's really good to create a vise and hold it quite firmly and taking a little bit at a time. It's really good practice. It just allows you to to have more control over, over the spoon you're working on and over the movements that you're doing and the knife. So this feels quite symmetrical to me, but now when you look on this side, it's not. So I'll just need to adjust the angle that I was cutting on. And then just bring it to symmetry. Okay, so the profile, 
the side profile feels pretty good. And now I'm going to start working on the handle on the top and on the bottom to have that almost complete. Um, and then we're going to work on the bowl. So we're going to do that. Okay, so now we're going to do the top part. And here is the same thing where you just slightly tilt it so then this knife is flat on the surface. And the idea is again just take a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, knowing that right here is where I need to go in a curve. And I'm taking just a little bit at a time to kind of know what I'm working with. And at some point, I'm going to work just on one side and then the other side and then the middle. It's just easier to create a flat surface then. And also if I want to accentuate the curve. Um, so I'm holding it quite like halfway through where I still have a grip on it. Up until now, I was holding it all the way covering the whole surface. But because I want to work right at the tip, I'm moving my finger, still being able to pre put pressure and uh, keep it steady. And the tip of my knife is going to rest just a few millimeters because that's about how much I want to take off. And then I can just push. And that's really how you work on this right very tip of the spoon. And once, because I want to get that little axi mark off, so that's how, that's how I do that part. And then we're going to check, of course, for symmetry if it's tilted, which it is, so we're going to do that, but not, not at the moment. For now, I just want to clean up this surface first. And just see what we're working with and see if the side profile is okay. And then we're going to really work on the, the top. Really pretty. So I'm taking a little bit of the time. Like it looks like you're creating bumps, but not really. If you're keeping the same angle of your knife, so if your angle, if your knife keeps flat, it's okay if you're creating little bumps here and there because you would be able to really level that out quite easily. And this is easier to switch at this point and do a thumb push. So I'm coming just a little bit into the bowl, just a little bit so I can see what I'm working with. And I'm going to stop here and just check. Are these lines parallel or, or symmetrical to the central line and you can see that there's a little bit of a belly here and a little bit of a belly here very little but much more pronounced so I'm going to take this down just very little because I don't want to risk having to take some from the other side and adjust it Okay, that feels good. And this is good too. I'm going to take a little bit more here. Okay, that feels pretty good. So now we have the side view, the top view of the handle. I'm going to work on the back, but actually first I want to check if the top view that we just did, the stop portion, if it's really parallel to the bowl. So I'm just looking, closing my eye, just as I was looking up at the, at the sky, um, I was, um, I'm keeping this line of the bowl, this right here as my knife is sitting, and just no, looking to match the line, the, the surface of the handle to be parallel with this. And right now, if you're looking at it as well, I'm noticing that it's slightly tilted. 
like the handle is slightly tilted compared to this surface. So I'm going to flatten this a bit more so then it's a flat line. Now here's where you can be playful. You can absolutely tilt it a little bit if it's for a right-handed person. It feels actually better if it's lightly tilted. But this is more like handle ergonomics that we, we can talk about. But for the purposes of this particular design, we want this surface to be flat, just like this. So I'm going to take some from this corner and then we're going to check a little bit more to see if it's leveled. And you can feel that with your, with your thumb. You can also double check by looking at it, looking at it from this angle. And I'm also going to look at it from this angle. And that's why when we were axing at the beginning, we wanted this surface to be parallel to the handle. And so there, all these are helping you to create the symmetry that you're wanting to create as you're, um, as you're working with the spoon. So, and that's one of the reasons why I'm creating the shape as the final shape of the spoon. So I don't have to go back and adjust symmetry or adjust angles. So because I'm doing that, every surface that I finish it's going to be the reference, reference point of my next step. So that's, being, that's the helpful part. I need to take a little bit more. Just very little and we're good to go. Okay, so now this surface is parallel to the bowl. Now I'm going to just do the handle and design, decide what's the, the curve, what's the actual thickness of the handle and coming all the way into the bowl. And that's going to be quite an easy cut. Um, so I'm really thinking about the curve of my handle right now when I'm going. And I'm not taking too much at the time, just because I want to make sure I don't cut too much into it. And I'm doing the same approach of doing one side first and then the other side kind of meeting in the middle. It's easier when you have a little bit of a piece of wood. So I'm thinking about how this curve feels compared to this. And right now it's rather on the thicker side. I'll just take in just a little bit more in. Something like that. And we're going to adjust this just slightly once we do the bowl because we want to follow this curve beautifully into this part. So we're going to adjust that a little bit. Um, now I'm going to work on this side and we're going to do a different cut now, a different, which is called the chest uh, lever, I think it's called, the chest pull which is a very, very powerful cut. And if you can do that, that's wonderful. So it's not so much um, just doing this. It's very much like pinching a pencil in the back of your back and just using the back muscles to pull your arms apart. Not so much pushing your elbows away because if you push your elbows away or you're using really your, your shoulder muscles, you want to use your back muscles to pull I'm going to slightly move from the table and that way you just have a really powerful cut and take away so much wood at the time and it's uh, saving your elbows if you do that as well. So I'm holding both my knife quite firmly like my fist is really not gripping like death grip but just really firm. The same with the spoon and I'm pushing in the same, pushing away sort of with the same force. Now there is also another way sometimes you can cheat and you can just hold one steady and pull the other. Um, for this particular cut you can also use this grip. Um, there are two kinds of uh, grips in this, in this way where you can hold the, uh, the spoon steady and push down with your knife. I particularly like the one where you steady your handle, where you steady your, your uh, hand with a knife 
and pull the, the spoon. It just feels easier on my body that way. So you have all these three kinds of, of grips to do the handle with. So whichever feels good for you, you can use all three of them so you'll have less, um, just have a better use of your body really. It'll be make, making carving easy. So I'm just taking now just the, the tip. I want to come to the thin, the thinness that I really want. So now that I have the handle and I have an idea of how that will look, I can take it a little bit more, more in and adjust that curve. And when I'm taking now, I'm taking a little bit at a time so I'm not using the those um, cuts that I was showing you, those knife grips, I can just do the thumb push just a little bit to control the, the curve. Okay. And of course you can go with, I would go thinner here. I tend to do spoons quite thinly and kind of push the boundary to where it's thin but still strong. Um, and with cherry, we have the luxury to do that because cherry is quite a hard wood, so when it gets dry, it will be really, really, really hard and hold its shape quite well. So I'm taking, I'm just taking the same thickness all around to the end and we're almost there. Just a little bit at a time and just feeling my way all the way through. At this point, especially if you have a, a wood that it's colorful and spalted and there's the grain showing and all of that, you can't quite see all the details. So you can't quite see if it's symmetrical. Um, you can't quite see all the bumps and such. So I use my fingers a lot just um, as reference. And I can also see and sense the curves that are not quite right if I do that. Okay, so that feels pretty good to me here. We might adjust this thickness, but from here on it looks pretty good. And now we're gonna work on the back of the bowl. And I do the back of the bowl first because like I said, all the surfaces that we're working on, each surface that you're working on dictates and becomes a point of reference for the next surface. So there are a lot of people who carve the bowl first and then do the back of the bowl. And it's probably the same theory. They use, um, they have an idea of how deep the bowl will go and they use that as a reference for how the back uh, will meet that thickness on all on the whole length. For me, I like to, maybe because I like the sends with these fingers, I just like when the bowl is finished on the back to feel that and use my thumb to kind of sense how I'm going to go inside the bowl and how I'm going to work with that. So that's my preference, I do the back first. Um, and it also allows me to, to have a a flow that it's final and allows me to see how the inside of the bowl will kind of match the, the flow of the spoon itself. So that's what I'm going for. So because I need to take quite a bit of wood here, we're doing the chest lever pull. And I, with every cut, you see me check. I check the profile. And what I'm looking for is this line and how close I'm coming into this. Remembering and also keeping in mind that this will eventually be a little curved. So I'm keeping that in mind as I follow this line here.
gosh, Chevy is just so nice to work with. Okay. So I'll ch check on this side. And this is another thing when we, like going back to the symmetry, because we made these sides be parallel to the spoon, now because I'm look I'm keep I'm using them as a reference point and I know that they are done right, I know that I can rely on having the same thickness on both sides. But if if this surface was not was uneven, then when I would work the back and having this as a reference it would have been all wonky. So I really, really um, encourage you to to use that technique and see how how that goes for you. Of course, this is why like, this applies for making. I just made me think of Dan, maybe because I just saw Dan the other day. But um, this is um, applies a lot if we if you're doing symmetrical spoons. If you're doing an asymmetrical spoon, then then it's just play and just really following the wood and um, following the shape of the one you want to create is not so much making things match. So we have. I'm going to talk a little bit about really quickly about the back of the bowl. So. A spoon that feels really good in the hand, in the mouth is a spoon that's from from the crank to the tip. It's rather flat on the back, so there's not. It doesn't go really deep. If it goes really deep, then these edges will come up against your lip, your upper lip, when you use the spoon. So I, from this point to the tip, I'm really trying to create it rather flat, like a very little curve here. So I'm going to take a little bit more and then having that done, I'm going to focus on this area to make sure that this curve flows really well into the handle. So from this point, I'm going to just take a little bit more of this, the thickness. I'm trying to do long lines and what I'm doing here is the same, the way you do a long cut is the same idea of pushing, pu pushing your, uh, pulling the uh, spoon towards you as you push away from you with a knife. So if I were to just push the, the uh, knife away, I could only do quite short cuts, but if I pull the spoon towards me and move the knife away from me, I'm able to really go the whole length of the bowl. So I'll just do that a few times so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm pushing the spoon towards me, pushing the knife away from me, pulling towards me, pushing away. So that way you can create these longer lines. And that's one way that you can do facets if you want to do facets on the back of the bowl. Um, but for now I just want to keep a rather even surface and sort of flattish and I'll check in a little bit. So we are getting there. This feels pretty good to me. We might, we're going to take some of this thickness down because this is going to come into a curve when I do, when we're going to go and do this, this, uh, this next step and start working on the bowl. But for, for now, I'm going to work from this point just here to adjust this curve because right now it feels a bit interrupted. So taking a little bit, working my way towards the handle and just feeling because right now I can't quite really see the bumps. It doesn't really matter. Um, you don't need to finish the spoon um, completely on the back, particularly because a lot of the wood oxidizes. So if you're, f I used to do that quite a lot and it was a very stubborn habit. And I would finish the whole spoon and in the morning it would be dry and oxidized everywhere. So I had to do it again. So I had to force myself to really not finish a spoon 
um, and just let it dry. Um, so I'm just gently working the curve up towards the handle. So I'm now I work from here to here and I'm going to just do this corner. And this is where we, where you decide, it's the point where we decide how do we want this line to be? Do we want it to kind of come to the side? Um, and the way that I've been doing the spoons and the way that I really like to do the Romanian spoons is to create a beautiful, like a flowing line like this on the back. So I'm going to follow this line and kind of just create this beautiful flow on the back as well. And we're just going to take the same, a little bit on the sides and just keep checking to see how, how the curve is. Is it too much in one area? Is it too much belly? Too much curve? How the angles are? So I just want this line to be a really beautiful flowy curve. And I'm going to leave it there and try to mirror that on this other side. And this is where you won't quite see with the naked eye and you just have to come and check with your fingers and check for symmetry. And your brain is going to really tell you and notice that, well, the left side is thinner than the other side and you're able to adjust. So what I'm doing, I'm putting these fingers on this surface and my thumbs here and I'm just noticing, are they the same thickness and this feels thicker to me. So I can just adjust it. Another way that you can check is by really looking and following the curves with your eye. Like if you're looking just down the spoon, you can just follow these lines and see if they're actually parallel or if they have a wobble, that means you need to check, take some wood off. Okay, so that feels pretty good. I'm going to maybe take some more here and take some of this thickness. And the way that you create like a rounded, like we're going to create a rounded end here. So I just take the corners in order to create a rounded surface. You just take the corners like this and then take the high points of that, the high points of that and just slowly create a round surface. So I like to do that because I like how to see the, the line, the edge of the spoon, and then see a little bit behind. It just creates a, a curve that is pleasing to the eye. But I'm going to change this curve just slightly because I like, I like to have a bit, of, a bit of a more gentle flow. So this is where you just, we, we can, of course, keep adjusting like that. And now I want to... So what I've been doing on the, the spoons that I really like on the back, it's um, something that, that I like to play with, is taking this line that so almost like creating a little bowl in a bigger bowl so I've I really like I have one here that I think I've done um, that it's like that we're gonna do something like this but I just like just little details that you can do on the back of the bowl you can also do something like this so you can just be really playful with the transitions. But I really like this, so we're going to create that really quickly. OK, 
Okay, so to do that, I usually um, draw on the back just the, the shape that I want to follow. And you can see the wood is already slightly dry. So I want to create a little bit of a circle or at the back of the bowl, kind of like that. And just have that as the, the reference. And I'm going to follow that. So I'm going to go a little bit lower on one side of the line and a little bit lower on the other side of the line so that that line that we just drew becomes the highest point on the bowl, on the back of the bowl. So I'm just taking all those high, just like that, just from the line itself, just going all around. Keeping in mind of the of the grain orientation, you can only cut up to here this way. We're gonna go have to go the other way around. But and we're going to check the profile as well. I wanna make sure that this line sort of kind of stops here in a way. But it still flows quite nicely. So we have this line that's going to go now a little bit like this towards the so kind of fades into the side of the bowl. And this is our the edge of the little egg that we're creating. And you can work on sometimes the wood it just allows you to go sideways but because this is quite wet it get it's quite fuzzy so it doesn't let me go sideways to clean up the high points of all these little cuts I could have done. Sometimes when it's dry, you can just go like this. But because it's quite wet, it won't let me. So I'm just checking now. As I'm, as I'm fiddling around doing this shape, I'm also observing and noticing that, oh, this is not symmetrical. So at this point, you can kind of follow that and make sure that especially because we're working on this surface. I want to make sure that the, the, the angles at which I'm cutting this edge is the same on each side. That allows for this curve to be symmetrical. So I'm looking at these, these surfaces that I'm cutting them at the same angle on both sides. So that allows for, for, for this edge to be symmetrical on one side and the other. And I can also check from looking up and looking down at it just to make sure that we're covering all the angles. Okay, so we did this part and now we're going to just follow the same idea on this side. We can just cut towards ourselves and away because the grain changes. Here, I'm noticing that I'm being stubborn and I, I cut a little bit too much in. So we're going to have to adjust it on this side. Like that. So now we have a bit of a, of this, just a wonderful transition on the back of the bowl that I find fun to play with. It's not something that I've 
really seen in the Romanian traditional Romanian spoons. They don't focus so much on on the on on the the transitions on the back of the bowl. They're quite very much the same. Um, so this is where I brought a little bit more of me into into the spoon and just make it a little bit more flowy and more, I guess, slightly modernized it, but while keeping quite a lot from the original. Okay, so we have the back of the bowl done. Just adjusting slightly some cuts here, just making sure that those are done. So now we're ready to do the actual bowl of the spoon. So when we do the bowl, the first thing that I do is just cut the, um, the angle of like clean up the edges. So what I mean by that is, I mean, I could go full on, but because I want to create a curve here, I need to take just the edge of it at a, gosh, I, I don't think it's a 45, like a 20 degree angle or something like that. So I'm starting from the tip. You can see that I'm just taking just the very edge using the tip of my knife and just slowly keeping in mind and paying attention to the rest of the curve. So I'm my my the reason why I keep doing that is because like I don't know, I think it tells your brain to really follow a certain line. So I'm following that line with my eye and also being mindful of the grain orientation because here I'm coming up against the grain so I can't quite cut in the same direction so I'm having to come down into it. You can go like this or you can also turn it around and creating that same vice, always creating a vice in creating a, your spoon quite stable and trying to cr follow that of beautiful curve on the side of the spoon, like that. So when you look on the profile, there's a beautiful curve that kind of follows, and it's in flow with the back of the spoon. So I like to be mindful of that. And of course we can adjust um, slight angles just to make sure that it's not so of an abrupt flow. So something like that. And now the fun part is trying to mirror that on the other side, which is always easier to cut on, on this side. I'm just noticing that there's a little bit of a break in the fibers right here. So I'm adjusting the curve again. And here I'm not putting a lot of pressure, I'm just really controlled coming into the curve because I don't want to risk having my knife kind of slip into it. So now we need to mirror the same curve and the same angle onto this side. So I keep checking to make sure that I'm doing the right depth. I'm going to take a little bit off just to kind of get an idea of what I'm doing. And now I can see that there is a little bit of a bump here. So before I start going forward into that rim, I'm just adjusting the edge. Just ever so slightly. So now, now this is okay. So how I'm checking for that symmetry, I'm looking from the tip down, looking at these lines that we just created. This is the one that we just worked on, and this is the one that we're working on now. So I'm going to try to make that parallel. I'm noticing that this is a little bit higher here, so I'm going to adjust it. So it's a constant just adjustment dance really 
And I'm also feeling with my thumbs. And just following that line into this groove here that we, the valley here that we have. And I'm going to also look from the other side, from, from the bowl down this way, I'm looking to make sure that this edge here is at the same level with this. So I'm noticing that one is higher than the other, this one. So I need to figure out from about what point do I need to go deeper. So I think about here. I'm just feeling still a little bit more. I'm just checking. It feels like just a tad more. You can also hold it like this, and sometimes it's easier to do this side in a curve. And just coming up into the neck and just checking again. That feels about right to me. Okay, so we did that. Now, before we start hollowing, which would be for, for a lot of spoons, now it's when we start hollowing. Well, because we're creating a Romanian spoon, they have the, that little lip that I was telling you about right here where the bowl just sort of completes in the circle um, and it doesn't um, it doesn't just flow into the handle but we complete the little egg shape so this is where we're going to lower the handle and have this lip stay up so what I'm doing now is just creating continuing the flow of the bowl, just like when we drew it with the um, with the pencil right at the beginning when we just started carving it. I'm going to do that now, just completing the egg shape of the spoon, something like that. And I'm checking from both sides just to make sure that I'm drawing it right and it feels okay, something like that. So now we're going to create that lip and then lower the handle. So the way that I create the lip, I really just start from holding the bowl and just really carefully, not to slip, like really gently, you don't need to press too much. With the very tip of the knife, just follow that line, just digging the knife tip into the into that line trying to follow it into at least the t the tip of the knife really needs to go into one line and follow that that we drew something like that and now i can come down and take maybe not as much as I just did, but just take some of it off, just a little bit, and then do that again. We're basically creating that little lip by taking a little bit from one side, a little bit from the other side, trying to keep a clean line and knowing that it's um, quite fragile, so 
be mindful that when if you pull this way to break the fibers you might tear it off so just be mindful that oh, this is quite a, a fragile little piece of, of raised wood so something like this and I can see that on this corner it's not quite even this feels kind of it's really flowing really well so I'll just take a little bit more just here and cutting, cutting it off just a little bit, just like that. And it's when it's wet, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, but once it dries, you can you can clean it up a little bit more and have have this transition be quite quite clean. Something like this. And now I'm also checking. I'm checking from this angle that that whole line of that little bowl that it's flowing, and you can see that those little two corners are not very flowing, just kind of comes up and then squares. So I'm going to just gently adjust that, just going in the direction of the grain, like on this side it feels like it wants to come this way, up to here, and from here it wants to go down. So just being really gentle to adjust that, and the same on this side. Not much, but just enough to smooth that line of the ball. Okay, so I'm also just cleaning up all the fuzzies a little bit for me to see better. So that's how we have the raised lip. And now we're going to just start hollowing the ball. So Andrea, are we moving on to the hook knife now? Yes, we are going to start hollowing the bowl. Now that we've done the back and we might need to adjust slightly the back, but having an idea of how the back of the spoon is, we can now actually put the bowl into the spoon and having a, an idea of the depth of the bowl and so forth. So I usually, how I start, how I work on the bowl is just having an a clear idea of how thick do I want the rim to be. So I take some of the bulk from the from the bottom, from the, the center of the bowl, and then I focus on the rim. And I establish how thick I want the rim to be and just follow that thickness. So I've decided that my rim is going to be about that thick and all around. And with the Romanian spoons, like usually the regular spoons have a thinner rim at the top and then they fade into a wider rim. But because we have this lip, it just looks better if the rim is the same thickness all around. It just sort of accentuates the bowl and has it stand out in a more even way. So we're going to follow that all the way around. And so I have that thickness and I basically putting the knife right at the beginning that far into the spoon all the way around just before I start the cut. So I'm placing it there and I'm pushing down, placing it and just pushing down. So I'm just kind of walking myself, establishing the rim all the way around. And I'm being mindful, of course, what part of the knife, the hook knife I'm working with, just to make sure I don't cut into the rest of the bowl or catch it. And for those that are curious, what spoon knife are you using? Yeah, I am using a, um, it's actually the first knife that I ever had, the hook knife, and it's a wood tools hook knife. It's their compound blade, which is wonderful. My mistake when I got it was that I was sharpening it on the inside 
and I just completely ruined it and I was very frustrated with it. But if you sharpen it on the outside, Robin has a, just a great video on how to do it. It stays really sharp. It has a wonderful handle. It's a great curve where you can use this bit of the hook where you, we will sh I'll show you to work into the deepest part of the bowl, just right here. And the flat part is quite flat for, for a good, comfortable bowl. So this is a wonderful hook, very, very affordable. I hardly recommend it. It's, <laughs> it's Deborah's, um, and I'm borrowing it. But yeah, this is the one I have at home as well. And I often grab it and use, use it just because I got used to it, and it's a very reliable tool. Very easy to sharpen if you do it right, and quite, quite good. Um, so I'm following the rim kind of just about to the deepest part and then I'll turn it around I mean to the to the crank line and then I'll turn it around and do it the other way around and the reason why I stop at the crank line is because this is where the ball comes up towards me so I would have to change the grain direction from here I will have to work from here down so I'm going to do the same thing on this other side. So I'm not going too deep into it. I'm keeping it quite flat because I want to... So this area, I'm keeping it quite flat because I want to have a good sense of how deep the bowl is and what flow do I want in the bowl. So I want to have a bit more control over that and I'm going to go slow. So following that line, the edge that I've decided to keep all around, just taking a little bit at a time, so it's sort of the same, the same thickness. And the movements that I'm doing, and just the same thing when you're using the knife, it's the same chest um, grip, I think it's called. Gosh, I don't know, just formal names, but. It's the same idea where you hold a spoon in a vise in the palm of your hand. How I explain this, a lot of people that start have a hard time with this. This is the most difficult grip. And what I usually do, how I explain it, you bring your, sh your elbow in, you keep this almost like a tray, your palm, and you bring it still flat, still holding almost like you hold a glass of water, you don't want to tip it. You hold it and bring it in front of your chest. And then you lower it a little bit you place your spoon into your palm and you just hold it steady with these two fingers or this finger. This is your vice. So your palm is towards you. If, because if you're having, having it like this, it's really hard to push your knife towards you. Your fingers want to go that way. So if you tilt it and have your palm this way, you grip with your fingers, then your knife, you can pull, you can push it towards yourself. So this is the exact same thing with a regular knife. It's exact same movement with the hook knife, except here, instead of going just up and down, even though sometimes I just go up and down, I often turn my wrist. When we have the knife grip, we don't turn our wrist. We just keep parallel because we're wanting to do straight cuts. But with the hook knife, you really scoop as you push towards yourself. So you gently follow the, the curve of the bowl you're wanting to create with the knife. So you're just having this really steady and just scooping a little bit at a time. So that's, that's the, the beautiful, you can get all these cute little curlies in the bowl. And we're going to do exact the same exact thing. I mean, most of the bowl you're scooping with this, with this uh, grip. There are different kinds of of scooping a bowl. A lot of people use this motion. Um, I don't have very uh, because I don't have very meaty hands. My uh, my tendons hurt when I do that. I'm sure that if I practice, I might. Um, I might be able to do it, but I'm just more comfortable with this particular um, way of holding the knife. So whatever works for you, 
whatever works for you, do that. So again, I don't want these lips to be, these sides of the spoon to be really raised. So I'm wanting to keep this rather flat. Um, I would rather take more from the back than, than dig too much into the, into the spoon here. So I don't want to scoop too much. I want to scoop a little bit. Maybe I'll scoop a little bit more here, but at least this portion, I want to keep it rather flat. So I'm going to meet sort of in the middle where it starts changing. And when, I, when we get here, it's where you can take all these, all this fluff off. And the movement that I'm doing here, I'm just gripping it like in my palm and pressing with these fingers. You can also just scoop without these fingers and just use this grip, but because I, it's not comfortable for me, I don't do it, but you can totally do that. And then here, I hold it like this and I just, um, well, sometimes I just come from it from this angle. Not going too deep. It's easy to go really deep using this part of the hook because it's quite deep. So I'm just being mindful not to go too deep. Try to keep the same depth as I had on the other side. Just like that. So now I'm going to do the same exact thing over here where I can dig quite, quite deeply. Um, I'm very aware now from this angle on how the light is shining that I really need to take some of this, these high points down from, just because I want that rim to be really clean. So I'm just cleaning up a bit these high points here. I mean, this we can definitely clean more when it's dry, but I just want to make sure that I give this rim a good chance before we start. Just because when it's, um, I can do that more confidently now, because when this is carved and you're going to have that little rim just kind of hanging off, it's going to be harder to adjust such a very thin piece of wood. So I would rather do it when I have all this wood behind it rather than adjust that thin piece. So now we're going to work from here down, trying to put the same rim around this part on the back. And here I can be a little bit more aggressive because I know I can go deeper and I do want to go deeper on this side. So just taking a little bit at a time. Just going as just going as deep as we can with with the change in the grain with the grain transition. Keeping the rim inside. And here is, is um, a little bit trickier to go around just because you might hit the rim uh, that you just created. So just go slow and be mindful. Change directions. A lot of, I mean, there's not, there's, there are other styles of doing this. Some people um, just go um, and carve the bowl, and then right at the end, they establish the rim. So there, is, there are different ways of doing it. There's no wrong way or right way of doing it. It's just what, you, what, I, what everyone gets accustomed to. I can notice that my uh, knife is getting the, like marks on it from not being very sharp at the moment. Let's 
So there are times when sometimes when you carve a spoon halfway through, you just need to sharpen your knife and sharpen your hook. And you can definitely do that if it makes your job easier. Such a beautiful smell, this cherry. Okay, so here's where I, I just decide, okay, how deep do I want to go? And I just end up checking with my fingers, but I don't go as deep as I want to from the beginning, just because even though I've made the spoon quite a few times and I know already, I just like to go slower and just make sure that every spoon has a good flow. Even there are slight variations in, in making a spoon even though you've made the same shape many, many times. So here I'm keeping it quite flat and I'm just coming a little bit deeper as I go towards the towards the the handle. And I keep twisting and just going from one end to the other. Just keep adjusting. Here is the more difficult part for right handed people. So just gently work my way through because the grain changes right here in the deepest bowl and it's a really awkward handle, a really awkward way to hold the handle and position. So if you're ambidextrous, which I'm going to intentionally work on, this is really, really good, a good advantage to have. So I've, I'm happy with how the spoon looks up to here um, once I clean up this corner. And then I'm going to work a little bit deeper into the back of the bowl right here. I want that to be a little bit deeper and come a little bit deeper towards the handle, towards, um, towards the bowl, I mean. So I worked my way out of this depth. So the, the rim looks pretty good to me on all around. Now I'm going to work my way deeper into the back of the bowl. trying to make, maintain that surface quite clean as well as I'm working. And this will be, will probably, I would probably go and do that again towards once the spoon is dry just to finish it off. Um, but for now this is pretty good. It's quite fuzzy when the wood is so wet and it doesn't have a very good finish. So this is where this hook is really nice because it just goes right up against that um, surface that you're wanting to work with. So it has a good, good angle. Okay. So there are some places where the the rim is just slightly thinner, but I'm okay with that. We can definitely adjust that with with a knife by lowering it just slightly. <sighs> okay. So this is this is the spoon. Like the the bowl feels quite clean and it's smooth enough. I would probably just 
clean it up just a little bit more, maybe adjust it just slightly deeper here after we made it deeper on the on the back just so the bow has a better curve of flow. Um, and then it's all ready and we can start actually do some cold rosing on it. Uh, or actually chip carving on this one. Though actually, before we do that, so the last thing that we need to do for, for the spoon is to, uh, you can wait until the edges are dry and you can wait until the whole spoon is dry, is to do the um, chamfer. Chamfer. Are, are, well. are they called? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's what's left. And then, then it's all ready. Okay, so the last step. We did the bowl, we did the back of the bowl, everything looks good. We can do the adjustments like slightly. When, when the spoon hits the light in just the right way, you can see all the tool marks. But what's left to do is now to do the chamfers around the handle and on the back. And this is where we can adjust if we want this thinner, we can do that with chamfers. So um, to do that, I just hold it, it's exactly the same, same cut. If you know how to do this cut, you can do all the spoons, really. So at a certain degree, and you can do the all the way down and get those really pretty curlies, or uh, do it in several, several pieces, really. It doesn't really matter. No one's standing on top of your shoulders looking at you like, then do a curly, but of course, if you do one, put it on Instagram, right, Zed? That's it. It's all about the Instagram it's likes. It's all about the Instagram likes, yes. <laughs> so, I'm stopping here, and from here down, I'm just gently taking a really thinner one, much thinner, um, and then working a little bit deeper to meet, except that I'm noticing that the wood wants to cut the other way. So I'm just going to follow that. And this is where um, you can make mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes. You can sort of slightly change design if you do. And no, no hurry, no problem. Just like that. And now we're going to just adjust the thickness of it slightly so it flows a bit better. If by chance the line that you did is not quite correct or didn't come out right, you can just adjust the top of the spoon. So you can definitely just fiddle with it and just get it right. You don't have to panic that you ruined your spoon. So we did this side. This is really wet wood. It's really challenging these. Okay. And now we're going to do the other side, and then we're going to be done with the top of the spoon. So, the same, just going down into the handle, a little bit thicker here, and try to see if it wants to go all the way, or meet right in the middle here just really listening to what the wood wants to do. Sometimes it's a bit fuzzy. And this is where you just slightly twist, twist the wood, the handle of the knife and just come out of the cut. I'm gonna just slightly Narrowing it, thinning it out a little bit. So now we have the chamfers, which I'm noticing that I went at a deeper angle on one side than the other. So I'm just going to adjust that. And that's something that you can absolutely do. And so they'll be symmetrical not only in in the curve but also the angle so 
So something like that. So now we have the front of the spoon that is done and these bits that are not quite perfect or, or fuzzy or whatnot, they can be absolutely adjusted when the spoon dries, which we can't quite do that here at the moment. So now we're going to do the back. And on the back, I tend to just start from here because I like these crisp lines. Sometimes you can also do a very, very gentle, like barely any. You can either use the knife or you can definitely um, burnish if you want to. And these lines can be burnished, but it's such a pity sometimes to, to burnish really, really crispy chamfers or, or corners and just take all that away with with a burnish but you know you can you can pick and choose and whichever you want to do that's fine and just work that all the way up I'm going the other way around here than I did on the back because of the grain going the other direction so here it's a little bit harder to keep it in one line And if, if by any chance you cut it a bit thicker, you just adjust it. Really, there's no... We're going to do that on this side. And just uh, work my way up, moving the grip of the spoon so I can easily cut with the knife. Just like that. And we're going to do the same with continuing that line on the end of the handle and then the same here and there we have it it's all ready so Two questions, Andrea, yeah. to wrap up the process. Um, drawing is the first question. What is your personal process yes. for drawing? So, I depends depends on the wood. Sometimes, if the wood is quite straight and there is no wobble in it, no nothing for me to worry about, I just um, take all these shavings that we've created and just put them in a paper bag and put the spoon in it open. I'll just leave it like that. Um, if, the if the wood has some knot in it or some movement or a little bit of a wobble, when it dries it will tend to tighten and accentuate that move, that um, wave. So I usually am more careful with those spoons and just have them dry as slowly as possible. Um, something like this that is really, really straight, I actually would be really comfortable to leave outside on the counter uh, as long as it's not right on the dryer or right on the really hot surface or on the window seal. I will just just leave it somewhere where it's shady and it'll be fine by in two days or so or even one day it'll be really dry. You can feel that the handle gets dry faster. Where it's thicker, you can sort of feel that it's a tad colder so it's not fully dry. but. Yeah, that's how I would go about it. And then once it's dried, do I assume you then do the actual finishing cuts? Yes, I'll do the finishing cuts. If, if of course, if it oxidizes, you will you'll do finishing cuts. Um, I like doing finishing cuts just because when you use a really really sharp knife on a dry piece of wood, you will get these really crisp um, or almost mirror like finishes. So that's really pretty. To do. You, will, you also get that with burnishing, but it's not quite the same. So yeah, finishing cuts are really nice for that. Um, and you can leave, you can, don't need to take your spoon to this stage before it dries. A lot of people absolutely do it, leave it much rougher and then do the finishing cuts when it's, when it's fully, fully dry and that you'll get a really crisp finish then. And the last question is oiling. What is your personal preference stroke process for oiling? Yeah, um, I use 
a walnut oil or tongue oil mixed with um, half and half, I mean, mixed with uh, citrus solvent, I think it is, some food grade citrus solvent. Um, I like both of them. I like the smell of tongue oil. Some people don't like the smell of tongue oil. Um, it cures really quickly and it leaves a really nice film on the wood that protects it. Walnut oil does the same, it just takes a bit longer. Um, it smells good. There, it's really easily accessible. You can find it at the grocery store and it's just as good. So those two are my favorite, particularly because they're on the more clear side. A wood would change color if you use linseed oil, for example, which tends to be really yellow. So it would be, if you don't want that, if you have a really pale wood and you want to keep that, I wouldn't use linseed, just something that's more uh, neutral. Out of the two, those two are really good. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for this video. Andrea, thank you so much. Thank you, Zed. That was fun. Thank that was the... F would I be right in saying that's the first time your process has been documented on YouTube? Yeah. Look at first. that. First. First time, and she was amazing. I always say this to people I collaborate with <laughs> on videos. If you don't hear me talking in the background, it means you're doing amazing. And she was on an absolute roll. That was awesome. Thank you. It was great for me to see your process as well as document it for others to learn. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was really, really nice to see your approach, how you do things. Um, it's amazing, no matter how many of these videos I do, I always learn and always get to see how people approach essentially the same, end up with the same item. Yeah, right? isn't that amazing? But then everyone has their Everybody own nuances. Everybody has their own style. Yeah, and in terms of what they're doing. doing it. So, guys, a few things to wrap up on this video. Number one, as mentioned at the very beginning, you can see the timestamps alongside this video. If you look at the bottom scroll bar, as well as the description below this video, that will take you any, to any particular segment you want to, because these videos are generally designed as a guide, as a tutorial that you can follow along. So be sure to check out all the various chapters to help you guide through this process that Andrea has kindly showed. The other thing I want to mention, as Andrea has alluded to throughout this video, is that all being well, we have the time today during my visit to see Andrea. We're going to be filming, filming either one or two follow-up videos. Uh, we're going to be hopefully looking at Andrea's process for chip carving a traditional Romanian design yeah. onto this very spoon. Doing it on uh, this one. Yeah. And a, another follow-up video will be corrosing a traditional Romanian design. And so if those videos are already out by the time you're watching this, Highly recommend you go check those out. Once again, links will be below, below in the description and pinned to the, co the top of the comments. On top of that, Andrea very kindly has offered to create a template very similar to the spoon that she's carved. That's 100% free for you to download. All you need to do is go to the link I will be putting down below. Once again, in the description and pinned to the top of the comments. You can go to her website and you'll be able to download the template for free. Thus. With the two combined, the downloadable template and this video, you'll hopefully be able to carve something very similar to what Andrea has shown in this video. The other two things to kind of mention is number one, uh, the Instagram, uh, where Andrea shows cases a lot of her work, as well as her travels here in the UK and abroad. It will mean the world to me if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, to head over to Instagram to give her a follow. Also, I would highly recommend if you go ahead and actually carve a spoon on the back of Andrew's this video and her template, then to tag her, that let her know. That would be great, yeah. It'll I be, would love to. It would be great to see what other people yeah. do based on the back of what you've provided in terms of the template. That so, would be really cool. So yeah, if you could tag Andrea and myself on Instagram, that would be amazing. And lastly, as I've just touched on a moment ago, I'll put a link to the downloadable template page, which is on Andrea's website, but I'll also put a dedicated link to her website main page. On there, you can then find out the myriad of work that she gets up to. She sells her wares. She also teaches one-on-one -on -one in groups. She demonstrates at events around the world. Yeah, and even Zoom teaching. Oh, you do Why Zoom not? teaching yeah. as well? I'll yeah. check that out. I know, right? That's it. I could have saved myself the travel to a video over <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> I'm joking. Right? <laughs> so there, there's, there's a plethora of things that uh, um, Andrea is getting up to, and a website is the central resource to then branch out and find out everything that she's yeah. doing. Lastly, um, if any of the viewers have any questions that they want to ask you in regards to what you show here. Absolutely, reach out. 
Would that be okay? Send me, DM, send me a message on, you can find me on Facebook, on Instagram. Absolutely. Through the website, you can ask questions. Yes. There you go. Please do. So any questions or queries you may have, please reach out to Andrea. Um, and the final, final thing, there's always a lot of final things with me, <laughs> so right? Is, um, this is something I always suggest to people. This is not what you have to do. This is just a suggestion. If you go ahead and download the template, which is 100% free, and you follow along this video, what I found through experience, and many, many experienced spoon carvers will attest to this, is what will help your learning process is to have also a physical copy of the spoon in front of you. So the reason why I stress that is Andrea, based on the stock she has available, she does actually make these spoons and variations of this particular spoon, as well as other styles of spoons that we showed at the very beginning of this video. But in specific relation to this traditional Romanian spoon outlined in this video, um, Andrea does carve these herself and sell them on her website. Yeah. So if you're able to, and you're, if you're in a position to, I would really suggest grabbing a physical copy of the spoon from her website. With those three combined, a physical copy of Andrea's spoon, the downloadable template, and this video, you're sorted. Yeah. Would you agree? I totally agree. No, that was really good. I, I like, regardless of just not trying to plug to buy it from me, but it makes such a difference to see a three-dimensional spoon, to just turn it around and just feel with your fingers and just try to see how it was done. Uh, it helped me a lot. And I've, yeah, I've bought spoons from a lot of makers and it was really, yeah, really same. useful. Same, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's only so much we can get across in video and photos and whatnot. And obviously we've done our best in this video, but nothing will ever be like a physical spoon in front of you because you can then feel the tactile, uh, how tactile it is, the, the, the flow, the shape, everything. And it's just like, it makes a day and night difference. And I've, everyone has suggested that too, to find a maker you like, get a physical copy of the spoon and the template, yeah. and it will change your game. Yeah. Um, and people have attested to that that how all of a sudden it just went from day and night difference yeah. to them in terms of their own learning process. And then ask me questions. You That's just, it, ask me a question. How did you do that? How was this? <laughs> That's yeah. it. So exactly. once again, Andrea, I really thank do you. thank you so much for allowing me to document your process so thank that you. it may help others. Um, guys, as mentioned, um, all the links to everything that I've outlined down below in the description and some of the important links pinned to the top of the comments. Be sure to check all of those out. If you have any questions or queries, hit Andrea up. And I'll leave you on the last note that please do check out the other videos that I'm gonna be filming with Andrea during my visit down today to see her. Once again, links to those will be down below in the description. So I really do appreciate you watching up until this point if you stayed all the way through. I really hope this video has helped out. You know, yeah. I learned a lot, like I said, you know, filming yourself and spending time with you today. So hopefully you've garnered some in insights and information as well. So on that note, guys, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From myself, Zed Outdoors and Andrea Grad. Thank you. Peace out. <laughs> Peace out.